Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on recent developments in the Romanian solar market. Today, I'm very excited as we have two interesting discussions to look forward to and an amazing lineup of panelists, as you can very well see. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our strategic partners at the Romanian Photovoltaic Industry Association, so RPIA, and specifically Arena and Adriana. And before we delve into um, the webinar, I have the pleasure of introducing ourselves here at Solar Plaza and a bit about the webinar ecosystem so you can understand how it works better. So my name is Dee, I'm a project manager at Solar Plaza. And if you didn't already know, we specialize in organizing solar conferences for our attendees to share knowledge and network. And so we also have the Solar Plaza Consultancy as well as the foundation with interesting projects on the way. So I do invite you to visit these in your own time or write in if you'd like to be involved. And of course, this webinar is in the lead up to our event, the Solar Plaza Summit Romania, that is happening on the 27th of April, 2023 in Bucharest. And indeed, many of our speakers will be attending. And at the end of the webinar, we'll, uh, we will share a unique discount code for you if you would like to attend as well. And now, so some practical notes. So if you have questions or any technical issues, you can check out kind of the sidebar on the right of your screen, and you can use the question box to kind of post any of the queries you have to the panelists, or if you're struggling with anything, and we are monitoring that, so we will reach out and we will solve it, basically. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, we'll start with a quick market overview with time for Q&A, and then we'll dwell a bit deeper into the barriers and opportunities of the Romanian solar market, both of which will be moderated by the lovely Irena. So a bit about Irena, she is a policy officer for RPIA and a background in international relations, political science, and European studies. And with that, Irena, I uh, give the floor to you. Thank you, Dee. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here. Although in Romania, the moment the weather is not the sunny, the forecast for, the forecast for our market surely is. So how and why? This is what we are going to explore here today together with you. The aim of this webinar is to aid you in familiarizing yourself with the Romanian market to give you a better understanding of the recent developments, of barriers, challenges, opportunities in preparation for the Solar Plaza Summit that will take place in Bucharest on April 27, where we hope to see you all. So, because the goal is to provide you with a comprehensive outlook, we have here uh, speakers with diverse expertise in distinct uh, sides of the sector. Now we have Mr. Andrei Mana, who is the Executive Director of the Romanian Photovoltaic Industry Association, who has a vast experience in the energy sector. We have Mrs. Georgiana Toma, who is the coordinator of the RPR's regulatory working group, who focuses on national and legal developments. We have Mrs. Mihaela Nergesh, who is a managing partner at Nergesh & Partners. Mrs. Nergesh has a broad expertise in the energy sectors, and she coordinated a complex investment, investment projects. Uh, and of course, our dialogue would not be complete without the developers. So we have Mr. Radu Enache, who is the managing director at Aukera, who has over 15 years of expertise in the renewable energy and sustainability. We have Mr. Florian Meininger, who is a co-founder of Kraftfeld, who focuses on uh, project development and legal matters. And of course, we have Mr. Bogdan Plutariu, who is Energy Elements Country Manager for Romania whose work focuses on project development and uh, supervision, managing operation, uh, so on and so forth. We are going to structure our discussion into two sections. We will begin with an introduction on the Romanian market. And uh, for that, I will give the floor to Mr. Mr. Uh, Andrei Mane to give us a brief overview of uh, the Romanian uh, solar sector. Mr. Mane? Thank you, Irene. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Great, great. Thank you very much, Irene. Thank you, Solar Plata, uh, for our partnership in these two events. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to to invite you also to also to our next event in April, the sum, uh, the Solar Summit. Uh, 
In this period of uh, intense development in the energy sectors in Romania, renewables and especially solar uh, have their part of the action. Together with our uh, members and colleagues, we are trying to, to grasp the most of this uh, in, in period in terms of new projects. In the same time, the association has a major role uh, to advocate that the best known practices uh, for permitting for development of projects to be implemented in, Rom in Romania and de dedicating a lot of effort to overpass the existing bottlenecks for this new wave of solar development. As Irene already said, the today webinar is dedicated to share the best practices, to debate the problems, and the main goal is to try to provide some solutions for them. So we now passing to the second wave of renewables in Romania. We have a very good start in the first wave, uh, which concluded with 2014 with the end of the support uh, scheme for green certificate. Now it's a different market. Uh, we see a lot of interest from new players coming to the to the country. And uh, this is a very good signal for the Romanian energy market. Today, uh, I invite you to, to follow our discussions to, to directly and uh, participate in, uh, in uh, the discussions through questions, uh, proposals, thoughts shared by, uh, through the platform. So thank you for, for your participation. And uh, Irene, let's uh, start the, the panel, please. Thank you for, uh, for the lovely introduction. Now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Georgiana, who is going to give us uh, a description of the actual regulatory framework in Romania. Georgiana? Buona dimineața. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Solar Plata. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, with not so many words, let's start. Basically, uh, I will try to describe a bit the general overview of uh, what the Romanian regulatory framework offers today, but also what uh, which are the financial tools that uh, they are at the disposal of uh, developers. And I will try to structure the, the ideas in the three major uh, categories, let's say, uh, permitting, market presence and uh, financial instruments. If we are talking about permitting today, we have to look at three major aspects, which are the land security, environmental endorsement, and the grid connection. If we are talking about uh, land security, uh, which is the first step in developing the uh, PV project or renewable in general, uh, we, we might say that uh, the land book and the cadastre registration is uh, lagging behind in Romania today. And from this uh, point of view, there are there is very difficult to identify and uh, contact the landlords. For example, there is a lack of uh, cadastre uh, measurements. There are missing or incomplete land books and uh, so on and so forth. And on top of this, um, since last year, when uh, some changes occurred in the law of land, there is a misinterpretation, let's say, from Minister of Agriculture, which doesn't allow uh, renewable projects to be, to be developed on surfaces um, exceeding 50 hectares. If we are going to environmental permits, uh, this one is the longest step in the entire permitting process because uh, Romania is a strong, has uh, strongly protected areas. There are uh, large areas with uh, Natura 2000 and uh, many other uh, protected uh, uh, areas and uh, there are strong uh, regional environmental protection agencies that uh, uh, they have very strict examination rules uh, for, from this perspective. So uh, today it's uh, quite difficult for Romanian government to identify uh, the so-called go-to areas that are uh, recommended at this point by European Commission and there will be further imposed. 
corroborating uh, environmental aspects with a limitation of 50 hectares, it's a big challenge for, uh, for the government to identify this, uh, this type of areas. And uh, if we are going, going forward to grid connection, also here uh, we have uh, big challenges that are not only in Romania, of course, because the networks were, uh, were designed, the grids were designed to uh, of uh, one-way flow of the energy from the big uh, power plants to the consumers. And today it seems that a revolution is needed in uh, the way in which the requests for grid connection are prioritized. And uh, in this regard, in our association, uh, of course, we are trying to improve something. We created an internal working group dedicated to to this topic, we try to identify and um, uh, identify the problems, first of all, and then to try to put on the table also some uh, solutions to the problems that we have, because uh, we cannot only say that we have problems, we also have to come up uh, with uh, some solutions and to discuss uh, this, uh, all these uh, aspects uh, in a larger frame with uh, the, all the stakeholders uh, involved in this process. But uh, it might look that it's impossible to develop uh, renewable or PV projects today, but it's not like this. I might say you that um, Romania is one of the countries with uh, the fastest permitting process in, uh, in the Europe. So, um, with all these problems, we are uh, on top. If we are uh, talking about market presence, as Andre already said, uh, no, uh, renewable capacities were added since the support scheme finished. And uh, for the operational capacities that we have today, we can see that uh, they are, uh, they are uh, imposed to pay additional uh, taxes. And this started uh, something like two years ago when the recovery of uh, COVID pandemic started and uh, the European uh, Commission uh, was uh, forced to take some measures in, or in order to, to, to adjust the, the energy crisis that uh, started that point. So um, they recommended a set of measures to be taken by uh, member states, by each government, in order to shield households and uh, small, uh, small businesses from uh, soaring energy bills. And uh, of course, uh, also the photovoltaic industry it was affected and it's still today affected by paying a contribution to a so-called energy transition fund. And this uh, will still be in place uh, in the next two years. The good news here is that the new capacities, the, um, the projects commissioned after last April, are not subject to paying this uh, contribution. And if uh, we are go going uh, forward to the financial instruments, uh, we have to say that uh, the current wave of uh, development uh, of uh, renewables has access to uh, financial instruments like never before, also in Romania, but also at the European level, because um, the, there is uh, this um, strong uh, objective of uh, of having the European Union independency in terms of uh, energy. And uh, here we have uh, investment aids as well as operational aids. And I would start with the uh, end of uh, 2021 when the energy directive was uh, transposed also in Romania. And since that time, they are allowed the power purchase agreement which were not uh, existing in Romania until that time, so more than one year. This year, we are uh, expect, expecting uh, from Ministry of Energy the contracts for different scheme. They uh, are uh, working uh, hard at this, uh, this project, at this uh, scheme. And uh, from their uh, declaration, seems that by the end of this year, we'll have the first auctions. Then we are also expecting this year, but we don't have a clear uh, timeline, the modernization fund. This is also delayed, but uh, 
it's uh, it's coming and uh, last but not least we have the funds uh, coming from a national recovery and resilience plan which offers a lot of money for uh, renewable projects uh, hybrid projects renewable with batteries uh, battery standalone and even uh, for the value chain uh, for uh, the, uh, the batteries and the pv panels and the uh, other components and uh, the most uh, the most the precious news let's say is uh, the um, the public debate for the repower eu chapter which is an important uh, important piece of uh, legislation that will be it will be added to national recovery and resilience plan it's under public debate until sunday and uh, in, in the association we are already preparing our position in order to to try to get as much as possible uh, from the funds offered uh, for um, for this industry. Uh, what else to say? All in all, um, the key message that uh, I would like for the audience to to take it uh, from today is uh, is the fact that Romania offers the best uh, legislative and uh, regulatory, or one of the best uh, legislative and regulatory frameworks in terms of uh, permitting. So it's uh, the development of PV projects is very fast. And uh, in order to obtain this, let's say there is a small secret that I would like to share with you. This, uh, this is uh, the fact that you need to have a project done by the book in order to, to succeed in this uh, industry. Uh, this would be all from my side. There is a sunny forecast for sure, and uh, we are ready to take uh, all, the, all the actions needed in order to make it even more sunny. Thank you. Thank you, Georgiana, for the very comprehensive introduction into the Romanian market. So to wrap a bit what you what you mentioned during your discourse, there are of course limitations when it comes to the Romanian TV development and of course challenges such as the 50 hectares issue, the bottlenecks regarding the noble to areas owing to the environmental consideration and of course grid connection issues that are present in part of country. But uh, on the British side, we have uh, one of the shortest permitting times in Europe. We have new financial instruments, we have CFDs, CBAs, and of course, a plethora of funds available for uh, this type of project development. To reiterate, to reiterate what uh, Georgiana mentioned, Romania offers one of the best frameworks in terms of, of permitting for solar PV development. Now, having had this introduction from uh, our uh, lovely coordinator of the working group, uh, I suggest uh, going to our panel with uh, where I would wish to have a more interactive uh, session. So for us to kick, up, to kick start the panel, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Andre, Mr. Andre Mana, um, because Georgiana mentioned and you also mentioned that uh, um, in the early 2010s, Romania experienced a renewable boom during which over one gigawatts of solar alone were installed. Uh, and since 2013, the development phase has decreased gradually owing to the reduction of the governmental support. How do you see um, the different, what do you see different from the first wave of renewables in terms of market development in Romania? Thank you, Irene. <clears throat> yes, indeed, Romania started in 2008 with <clears throat> zero experience. Uh, we base whatever we build there and developed in that period on uh, experience brought by outside the country. Uh, we learn by doing, not only us as developers or investors, but also the local and national authorities. Uh, <clears throat> it was a period of struggle uh, in which we try to to learn and, and to improve. Sorry, <clears throat> at you we at every step we made it was not so easy uh, and also in that period of time the the let's say the the force behind the development was related to a support scheme uh, the green certificate support scheme was which was very generous at that moment in time 
Without uh, it, I don't think uh, any renewables will be installed at that moment in Romania. Now, compared to what we have now with that period of time, I think, uh, first of all, we have a huge experience, not only in developing, but also in operating the existing capacities. We have uh, developed also our market, uh, energy market experience uh, together with authorities. Uh, there are several changes in market which help renewables better integrate. It's not over yet. We still have one of the biggest uh, costs of uh, imbalances in Europe, but we think that uh, in time this will be will be also covered by the new uh, energy market design. Uh, moreover, in this period of time, uh, we are uh, having at our disposal, as also my colleague Georgiana and Irene said, uh, huge amounts of money dedicated to energy sector, which will come, which should start coming uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we saw we saw from the <clears throat> national authorities uh, the opening of uh, tenders uh, for renewables. We are all waiting to see them implemented. Uh, we are waiting also for the famous CFD in Romania, which we are discussing for several years. Uh, we hope that this year finally we're going to have it in place. Uh, besides this, uh, compared with the first wave, uh, now we have also the need of energy, of electricity in our case, uh, because in 2008, 2010, 12, uh, Romania was a net export of energy. Today is not the case. Moreover, we are passing through different uh, to more difficult and different period of time in the energy market in in the world, but also. Of and moreover in Europe. So we need to regain our energy independence. So this is something we didn't have the pressure in that moment of time. It is new for us. Uh, what we succeeded to develop it's uh, in this period of time, and uh, I think it's obvious for everybody which is in this, in this market, it's a skilled workforce. Uh, starting from uh, developers, uh, lawyers, uh, technicians, whatever person which is involved in uh, in our uh, sector for the past 10, 12 years. So I think we have some advantages now compared with uh, the first wave, and we should take the the opportunity and to start building uh, as soon as possible new capacities. It's not easy, as uh, my colleague said already, there are some uh, bottlenecks, let's say problems, issues with the permitting. We'll debate them uh, today, but for sure uh, those could be overcome in the next period of time. Irene, thank you. Thank you, Andre. Yes, indeed, the context really differs compared to the early 2010s. And uh, I think it's really important to discuss these issues in order to um, come with solutions and uh, to unlock Romania's natural potential. So regarding the issues, I would like to direct my question to Mrs. Mihaila Nirgesh. And I would like to ask you, what are the main recent developments in the renewable legal framework and how do they impact the development of solar projects? We have heard about the 50 hectares issue, but what does this issue entail? And could you give us a better understanding of the subject? We cannot hear you. Now? Yes, now we can hear you. It's all good. Yeah, you can hear me now? Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Irene. Thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Um, indeed, under the pressure of um, EU ambitions in terms of deployment of renewables and uh, the geopolitical context, the Romanian legal environment uh, was, has been intensively amending uh, during the last couple of years. Most of the amendments had a very positive impact on the permitting process and in general on the legal environment uh, regarding the development of PV projects, which already is, uh, as Georgiana just mentioned a bit earlier, much friendlier and shorter than in uh, many other EU countries. Uh, however, along the way, some of these um, amendments brought also some new challenges along the way. Um, I think the, the most important uh, legal change was the one you just mentioned, uh, the 50 hectares issue, which is on the lips of everybody. Um, it, it refers to the change of the legal regime uh, regarding constructions on agricultural land. Um, this is one of the cases where the change was meant to improve the permitting process and ended up doing the exact opposite. Uh, very briefly, the lands in Romania are of two types, uh, intramuros uh, lands, which are located in the build buildable area of, uh, of uh, the cities, of the communes, and lands located extramuros, outside this buildable uh, area. Um, the qualification is being done by the general urbanism plans, which are, must be adopted by the local authorities for each uh, unit or territorial unit of the country. Uh, the general rule is that all constructions uh, must be conducted within intramuros lands. Whenever an extramuros land is targeted for a project, a PUS, a zone of urbanism plan, needs to be adopted, whereby the land qualification is being changed from extramuros into intramuros. For this, an important endorsement is an endorsement from the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, there, are, there were some exceptions from these rules, like type of constructions which could have been built on extramuros land. However, until last year, none of these exceptions apply to renewables. Um, this is basically how all PV projects were developed in the first uh, wave of renewables and in the second one until beginning of 2022. All lands were moved by means of a PUS. Uh, into intramuros uh, area. Um, what happened last year is that uh, the legislator wanted to simplify the process and wanted to add basically renewables among the type of constructions that can be built on extramuros land, which it did. So basically the only change uh, uh, brought to the legislation was to add among the exceptional types of construction the renewables fulfilling two conditions. One is um, the surface of the land should not exceed 50 hectares, and uh, the land should be a low fertility, uh, should, be, should, be low, uh, should have a low fertility, meaning should have a fertility class from three to five out of the five available fertility class in Romania. So after this change, everybody was, of course, expecting that projects fulfilling these requirements would be built uh, directly on extramuros land without the need to move this land into intramuros areas, while the projects which do not fulfill this requirement would continue the general process uh, followed uh, until then. However, uh, it is the interpretation of the Ministry of Agriculture that as a result of this change, um, renewables can be developed only to the extent they fulfill these two conditions. In other words, projects which are developed on lands of uh, fertility class one or two, or projects which are exceed 50 hectares can no longer be developed in, in Romania. And as a result, the Ministry of Agriculture has constantly rejected all applications filed for this mandatory endorsement, which is mandatory in the process of, of PUZ. The PUZ. Um, what is important is that were rejected also files that were submitted to the Ministry of Agriculture long before this law was even adopted by, by the Parliament. The result is, uh, and the impact on the market is huge. There are numerous projects affected and numerous investors. There are uh, uh, affected projects for which the investment process was started long before this, this uh, law even started to, to be discussed in the Parliament. 
um, and these projects, we're talking about projects that were, for example, sold, and now the developers need to, to bring the projects to ready to build status. Uh, we are talking about projects that risk the, the um, face the risk of losing the connection to the grid because um, within 18, 18 months from obtaining the right to connect to the grid, they should obtain the building permit, which currently cannot be obtained in the absence of such a food. Um, also, new projects are, are being affected because it is um, basically the result is that we, don't, we should not have in Romania projects above 45 megawatts photovoltaic projects because basically this is the highest capacity you can get on 50 hectares. And uh, there are also problems with connecting these pro projects uh, to, to the grid because they no longer have access to to uh, transmission grid because the connection costs are pretty high for a project of, of uh, such a small project. So I would say this is the biggest development and uh, highly impacting the PV development in Romania. Another change is very much related to this one is um, elimination of the need of a PUZ for a renewable uh, project. Um, very, very briefly, um, the purpose of the PUZ is twofold. Uh, one purpose is to requalify the land from extramuros to intramuros that we just discussed about. But another purpose is to change the urbanism parameters of the land whenever the, the parameters approved through the general urban plan are not compatible to the design of the project. So whenever a project is not compatible to the uh, urbanism parameters uh, already approved through the general urban plans, the authorities very early in the process will impose the developer to change such parameters by means of a zonal urban plan. Zonal urban plan is one of the most time consuming uh, stages of the development process. So um, the elimination thereof was on the agenda of, of the authorities. Um, however, all the, the law that we just discussed, uh, inserting the, the right to, to develop uh, projects on extramuros land, had as final purpose to eliminate the pools as a whole. The legislature did not consider the correlations between various legal enactments, and as a result, um, it did not reach this purpose. So the, the only purpose it reached is to, to eliminate the need to, uh, of a first purpose to move the land in Tramuros, but the pools continue to be necessary. So a new intervention was necessary and uh, it was um, adopted uh, earlier this year. So as a result of this intervention, pools is no longer required in case of projects fulfilling the two conditions I mentioned. A bit earlier, meaning uh, 50 hectares maximum uh, surface of land and low, fertil uh, low fertility class of the land. There are still some problems in the market. For example, there are projects that affect both extramuros and intramuros land. And in this kind of situation, you would still need basically to do a pool for part of your project, which of course delays the, the duration of the permitting process as a whole. However, there is a legislative initiative in the parliament to eliminate the pools also. On, uh, on intramuros land, so we are carefully assessing, uh, following the, uh, the developments on this uh, legislative initiative. Um, another important development was inserting the concept of dual use. It was also inserted last, uh, last year. It is what is known in other systems as agrivoltaic projects. Unfortunately, the law allows dual use only on, um, on vineyards, Orchard and pastures, so for arable land it is prohibited. Uh, although I see an interest in this market in the market uh, for developing uh, agrivoltaic projects also on arable land. Um, the highest interest now right now uh, and the highest opportunities I see are for pastures. Pastures were under the focus of the developers for a long time because they are um, compacted uh, plots of land uh, owned by the same owner, strategically located next to the grid. However, they were long avoided due to the fact that pastures have a very strict legal regime and basically developers need to recover a corresponding uh, surface of unproductive land. Um, before dual use uh, of the land was inserted, uh, um, corresponding surface of land meaning basically the entire area of land uh, affected by the panel projections on the ground, which is huge surface of area, and in practice you can't find these um, important surfaces of non-productive land. But now, 
since the DOU system uh, has been inserted, the surface of the land that basically needs to be recovered is much, much uh, lower. It's, it is estimated to be around 5-10% of the total surface of the project land. Um, therefore, projects on, on pastures are, uh, are more feasible and um, actually there is a very, very big interest in the market uh, for these types of land. Unfortunately, nine months after um, the concept was first introduced in the legislation, we are still lacking a secondary legislation from the Ministry of Agriculture uh, that should be uh, followed uh, during the permitting process of, of uh, the pastures. I cannot hear you anymore, Mihaela. Can I say something again because it seems like it's working? Is, is it working now? Okay. Now it's working. Um, so another development here refers to the legislation regarding storage. Um, storage still faced important barriers due to the insufficiency of the secondary legislation. And an important challenge came from um, the interpretation that uh, if you want to add storage facilities, storage systems to, to generation plants, you need to increase the evacuation capacity. <clears throat> Uh, with the uh, installed capacity of the storage systems. Uh, however, uh, ANRA amended the legislation and uh, eliminated such interpretation, clarified that you can have um, storage uh, facilities systems stand alone or add it to operational projects or to, to new projects. Also, very recently, ANRA regulated the technical parameters that should be observed and uh, the commissioning requirements. And um, again, there is a high interest for storage systems in Romania, and we, all, we can already see uh, the first uh, ATRs, the first grid connection permits uh, for PV projects, including also storage uh, facilities. Um, a, very, a very important change moving a bit uh, away from the permitting is the one Georgiana just mentioned about uh, uh, removing the PPA ban. The, PPA, uh, the PPAs in Romania were prohibited from 2012. It was a, a response from the authorities to, to very long-term agreements concluded by Hydroelectrica, state-owned producers at very low uh, prices, prices below market price. Um, and as a result, the state intervened and prohibited the, the execution of PPAs for the entire market, private and public entities uh, alike. Uh, this was alone, like a legal intervention that um, dramatically affected the development as of power plants in general, not only of renewables, because uh, as a result of this change, you could conclude, um, you could trade electricity only on centralized markets operated by Ofcom. However, on these markets, you were only licensed operator, operators, so entities having operational power plants could participate. Uh, not also developers. So developers have basically no way of uh, securing a long-term uh, energy price and therefore could not obtain financing for, for the project. So now we finally have uh, PPAs again. We still have some problems with market liquidity, bankability of the off-takers, but um, there is also an interest from corporate, by corporate PPAs. Uh, so things are, are moving also from this perspective. And maybe the last development I, I would mention is um, the one also. Again, I cannot hear you. I don't know what's happening. No, I think it's working again. What about now? Yeah, it seems that my computer has its mind of its own. So sorry about that. Um, so a last change I would I would mention is um, the contract contract for difference scheme because it's a very very important uh, legislative change. 
uh, and it is a very interest, a big interest for uh, for investors, um, and it may contribute to to a very high extent to the deployment of renewables. Discussions on this scheme started many years ago at the time when the PPAs were prohibited. Uh, to to set the uh, the current status very clearly, we do not yet have legislation. Um, Ministry of Energy just presented the main principles of the scheme in two market sounding events. Um, and now it is under the scheme is uh, under the pre notification process uh, with uh, the European Union. Um, but the expectations are that the legislation will be drafted during the first semester of this year and we will already have a first call during the second semester. Uh, the ministry launched an expression of interest at, at uh, a call of the expression of interest at the end of last year, but it was purely statistical. It is basically a, a research done by the ministry to understand a bit what is the interest in the market and uh, what kind of projects um, would be uh, would be used to, to apply for, for this scheme. So the expectations are that the first call will be launched uh, this summer and um, the next calls every two years in 25, 27 and 30. Uh, basically, in, in brief, uh, the CFD system is a support scheme whereby producers are guaranteed a certain uh, specific price for every megawatt hour of electricity generated and sold. It's the strike price that the uh, producers auction uh, during the, the call. Um, the, the, it, it operates the two-way payment system between this strike price auction that by the producer and the market reference price. Uh, which is the weighted average monthly day ahead market price. If the strike price is uh, lower than the market price, the producer um, receives the difference from the CFD counterparty, which is uh, supposed to be of comp. And if the strike price is higher than the market price, the producers um, uh, will, um, will uh, receive the difference from CFD counterparty. Um, the Ministry of Energy used the UK system as, uh, as an inspiration source, but there are also some uh, innovative uh, principles. For example, the scheme will be financed by the Modernization Fund, fund instead of uh, being financed by a tax payable by the tax consumer as initially uh, envisaged by the Ministry. And it is highly beneficial because it will release the pressure from the, from the final customers. It solves the PPA counterparty risk that we just uh, talked about. Um, it is planned to have some uh, change in law and change in tax provisions, which I think are, will be very important, especially considering the history we have with the um, changes to the green certificate system. So investors are more prudent when, uh, when uh, entering into these kind of support schemes. The problems I see is that, for example, the storage projects are excluded from the first call. And to me, this seems a bit of a lack of coherence because on one hand, the authorities are, are encouraging the investors to install storage. On the other hand, um, in the, uh, the grants granted by the, under the National Recovery and Resilience Plan uh, project with storage were favored. Yeah, the, they were given the higher score. However, CFD excludes uh, such projects from the from the first call. Uh, we hope to to maybe this would be remedied in the final package of legislative package. Also, another problem I see is that the ministry is, is considering uh, to impose the eligibility requirement in addition to the grid connection permit. Also, the setting up authorization. So the setting up authorization might be an eligibility requirement to apply for for this scheme. And I think this is a problem and it will basically exclude small investors because in order to get setting up authorization, you need to provide evidence that you already have the source of funds to do the project or um, the CFD scheme should, should uh, help or basically obtaining the finance for the project. So I, I think it's very important that when the ministry will launch the public consultation regarding this legislative package that the industry will get involved uh, to, to make sure that uh, the final legislative package will meet all the market concerns. Thank you, Irena. Thank you, Tom Mihaela. Now, having had this legal perspective coming to you, I would like to open the floor for the developers. And uh, since you both you and Jordana mentioned uh, the 50 hectares issues, I would like to I'll ask the developers, maybe in the order that, order that they are on uh, the slide, 
how the existing situation with regulated uh, projects below 50 hectares without PUZ affects the permitting procedure for projects over 50 hectares? Uh, Mr. Plutarin, would you like to do like the first? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, for this call, which I think is very useful. Um, so yes, answering to your question, uh, this let's say blockage that we face now, it uh, it's affecting the the big projects, and uh, unfortunately, some of these big projects already started before the law was updated. So now we found ourselves stuck, and we cannot permit and uh, have puses on projects uh, um, uh, bigger than 50 hectare surface and no one knows how to, to proceed so I think we are looking to to increase the, the renewable energy capacity in the country not to decrease it and not to block it therefore uh, also to RPI and uh, so on we had uh, numerous discussions with the government in order to, to find a solution to this situation which is is not uh, is not good for us, uh, and also uh, everyone needs to understand that beyond this blockage also affects the budgets and the timeline of the projects because all of us we invested money uh, and now we are stuck and we are looking at we cannot advance with the projects and this costs um, and everyone wants to to close the project to to to, to sell energy and so on because this is the the main reason why we are developing these projects. And therefore, um, we need to to get the understanding of of why this is happening, and also to have the government along us and support us to 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 do this. Thank you, Bogdan. Uh, Radu, would you like to add something in this regard? Yeah, no, it's okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, at not so uh, sunny uh, forecast, I would say. Uh, totally agree with uh, with Bogdan. And uh, I know you, you, you and Georgiana started saying uh, it's one of the best legislative framework and regulatory framework we have in Romania. I tend to disagree. Unfortunately, we are kind of stuck. Um, what can I say? Uh, Ten years ago, yeah, it was different. A lot of things changed, but still there are two common issues. I can see the grid is still uh, still blocked. Uh, nothing, nothing changed in over ten years, and it's still a kind of anxiety. You don't know what legislative change will come, in what direction and if there are any transitory measures. Uh, as Bogdan mentioned, there are several projects we started before the changing uh, the changes of the law. That's not mine. Um, and there are several developers which started the project on the former uh, on the former low, maybe with uh, uh, lens class two, maybe started the the pools very advanced with the project, and now they are completely completely stuck. So that's not quite a great perspective. Yes, I understand, but those are some hurdles that we will overcome one day and tackle them. So things may be stuck now, but in the future we will surely solve them. But I would like to ask you, what is the effect of uh, the 50 hectares threshold in permitting and financing projects? Like from the financial point of view, how does this 50 hectare limitation affect? Well, it's actually, actually it's, it's very difficult because from our discussion with several lawyers, um, breaking up the project in different smaller projects below 50 hectares um, is not quite legal. And the question is, uh, you don't do anything. You put all option on the table and just look what is the less harmful one. Um, or try to push the authority to, to change on the right direction. It's exactly what we are doing in, inside the association. And hopefully in the end, 
someone will realize and will, will, will change this provision because otherwise, at least for now, it, it looks like only project class uh, 345 below 50 hectares are eligible to, to be developed. And as Michaela mentioned, there are so many projects at this level, the, uh, the network is blocked, so you don't have access to the PSO line. So we can't do much today. Sorry, I, I know it's uh, it's uh, often said uh, we should be should be very creative. No, we can't. We should be creative in some very well defined boundaries. Thank you, thank you, Radu. Yeah, yeah, I would like to add something here, and I agree with uh, with what Radu said. And also, uh, everyone needs to understand that each project, when it's it's finance, it goes through a due diligence process. And uh, as Radu said, I talked with, with several uh, law, law firms and all of them, they told me that they were raised as a red flag if we try to split the project in below 50 hectares, if you have a bigger project, like, I don't know, 150 hectares. So theoretically, what the current legislation does obligate us to break the law if we want to do that of course no one wants to do that but still we are now in a blockage and we don't know how to solve this and no one came back with an answer what we do with the money that we invested until now and what's the next step because we had discussions back and forth and nothing happened so this needs to happen fast and for this i would like to, to take a step back a little bit because we need to understand why now the renewable energy is a must because if 10 years, 15 years ago, it was, let's say, a pioneer testing of the industry and which was very expensive and so on. Uh, now it's a must and it's a must due to several reasons. First, the lack of oil and gas due to the uh, relationship uh, between Europe and, uh, and uh, Russia. Uh, second, I think some of you already knows Europe is facing now an issue with the water supply and this it's forecasted that it's going to uh, get worse. Uh, this for sure will affect the hydro and nuclear energy and we need to prepare from now for what is going to come. All of us, we know that coal is not a solution anymore because it's a very polluting source of energy. So we need to stop that. So what to do? Renewable energy. Now it's, I think, three times cheaper than 10 years ago. So why not doing it? But in order to do it, we need to have a clear legal frame in order to encourage us to develop and invest in such projects. And um, also to point the subject that Radu started, if we are changing the legislation at three weeks or three months or so on and nothing is clear, I don't think the appetite of the investors will grow for Romania at least. They'll get scared and I will get scared to, to put my money at risk, knowing uh, unknowing what will happen in the in the following uh, months. Thank you. Thank you, Bogdan. Florian, I see that you are also here. So would you like to add something regarding the 50 hectares? No, I think um, I can emphasize what Bogdan just said. I think the worst thing that we could wish for is now for another legislative change. I think it, the legislative framework uh, is okay, yeah, let's say. It's uh, just uh, the problem is that we are struggling with the interpretation of the application of the current laws by the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, which uh, is um, just the decision within the ministry or within the government that could be made very easily to change uh, this interpretation and uh, all problems would be solved yeah but in fact i can confirm also for our projects we are uh, developing these uh, we are for many years in romania but the new developments we started uh, in the end of 2019 so these the projects have been in development phase for two three years which suddenly in the mid of 2022 or let's say in autumn, because in the beginning nobody knew, <laughs> uh, we realized we had to restart the permitting for the projects bigger than let's say 50 megawatts, uh, which which of course is, is a huge problem. And uh, there are uh, ATRs or grid permits and grid permit applications for these projects. And they are at risk 
uh, and all the work that uh, the transmission grid operator, Trans Electric, the grid operators put into approving grid permits, all this work could uh, could go uh, could be lost because uh, there are, as you probably know, there are deadlines. After the you receive your grid permit, you ask the you have to provide your building permit within a uh, few months. And of course, if you are forced to restart the whole uh, permitting because of these legislative um, uncertainties, um, it's it's a huge problem and it could uh, throw back the whole industry uh, for years. Yeah, and it's it's a serious thing. Uh, I'm I'm still optimistic that it gets solved because as as I've told you, it's just the interpretation of the of the wrong, inter obviously wrong. It's a market consensus, it's a consensus within lawyers that this is the wrong interpretation and this just needs to be changed and then we are back on track. But if we are now starting to be creative to introducing new laws, uh, as is discussed in the Senate currently, or I don't know, uh, thinking to introduce European legislation about the one-stop shop or the, uh, the, the go-to zones, uh, this would be a nightmare in my opinion because it would take months and months and months to get this legislation in place, months and months and months uh, to see how this is then uh, administered uh, on uh, through these institutions. And we would lose uh, easily two years uh, uh, until we get to a stage where we can continue. And the conditions are worsening at the moment. No, if we, we would have, uh, if we would have uh, had our projects permitted, I don't know, uh, 16 months ago or 18 months ago, uh, the financing uh, market was very different. Uh, interest rates were very low. We could have produced electricity at much lower uh, cost, uh, or, uh, level as cost of electricity. So um, I think it's, it's really a call to the authorities to, to sort this out. I, I would like just to to add that I'm not against of uh, legislative changes that that, that are good. Uh, definitely, legislation needs to be to be changed to be adapted. Is one provision or, or rule which basically says from grid offer from APR we have 18 months to get building permit. Now we we can see on the market uh, grid operator release uh, APRs with 2030 already so what happened between uh, 2024 and the uh, end of the decade not clear so definitely there are uh, several aspects to be correlated with the uh, with the reality but what i i try to highlight we need a kind of transitory measures if you started on a piece of law to have the chance to finish your project on on the same grounds Um, because all of you mentioned the issue of illegality when it comes to splitting up projects, I would like to ask Mikhail, what are the main legal challenges faced by investors in Romanian solar market and what are the potential solutions? Once again, the laptop is not, is not cooperating with us. Maybe now we're lucky? Yes, thank you. So um, um, I would say as a, as, a, as a general comment that the highest uh, problem is with, we are facing with, is with uh, the rise from the legislative instability. We don't have a clear legislative strategy and um, sometimes the, the legal solutions that, uh, and we see that when the legal solutions are implemented, uh, the legislator does not consider uh, all correlations between all legal uh, provisions, um, does not introduce uh, transitory provisions that would clarify how the new provisions impact on ongoing projects. And uh, we see this, for example, with um, the PUS, 
use that, so the pools was um, eliminated. However, the vast majority You now? can try. Yes, yes, it works now. Okay. So um, um, I, I was saying that uh, we are often lack, lacking transitory provisions in the in the new laws. Transitor provisions that would expressly regulate how um, the new law impacts on ongoing projects, so as to prevent different interpretations from uh, from local authorities. And an example we see is with the uh, with the PUs, that the vast majority, or although the, the the purpose was to simplify and speed up the process, the vast majority of the local authorities interpret that in order to benefit of the new law, you need to get a new urbanism certificate and basically. It's happening again, Michaela. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the the introducing of transitory provision will clarify all these uh, all these problems so as to avoid the situation that we're currently facing with the PUZ that is as I just mentioned is of the vast majority of the authorities uh, request to restart the process in order to benefit of the of the new law which which basically is is uh, uh, defeats the the whole purpose of the legislative change. Um, we need a clearer, a more transparent legislative process to, to uh, a better involvement from the industry in the legislative process to make sure that the legal solutions address the problems correctly and solve it in all legal, uh, and all legal amendments are, are implemented. Once again, it seems like it doesn't want to cooperate. Technology revolts against, against us. Next time we will meet in person to avoid this kind of uh, problem. Yes. Indeed, in the same time, we, we are all knowing about the pro problems. We know what yeah. can be done today. And uh, I want to underline that in this period of time in the parliament, there is a debate. Uh, a change to the urbanism and construction law, which we are hoping to integrate also some proposals sent by the RPA in order to clarify the process of uh, removal of the lands from the agricultural circuit. Let's see also the, the sunny part of, the, uh, of this day. Well, it's clear that one way or another, the Romanian energy industry is on a green path. And, and of course, it's accelerated by the external factors, such as the imperative for energy at uh, affordable prices. Now, where is the measures, uh, where is measures were taken to streamline the process? And we've seen them. Some of them had a somewhat negative impact in the Romanian legislation. I would like to ask you all, based on your experience in project development in other countries other than Romania, what are the best practices you believe should be implemented at the national level? Yeah, I, I could add it's it's uh, in comparison to the other markets where we're also developing project, uh, Romania has a, a relatively good framework. Uh, also in relation to the grid approval, I think it, in my opinion, it's very slow. Yeah? But still, it's a, very, a relatively transparent process. You sit down with the grid operators uh, in the course of the solution study. They analyze the entire system. You know, there's transparency. There can there are technical solutions for problems. This is not the case everywhere. So there are countries where you just uh, there's no discuss no discussion. There's no transparency on the availability of uh, capacities. So it's good. Yeah. Also. 
latest uh, legislation for the 50 hectares, I think in principle is good. If we could get back uh, to the rules for the POZ for the project uh, more than 50, it would be good, better than other places. Yeah. Uh, but the challenge uh, really with the uh, Romanian uh, project development is, is the, the gray areas of the law. Yeah. Because there is not, uh, there's always uh, this, the laws are always uh, unclear. Yeah, there's always room for interpretation, uh, and and uh, this makes it so you have to be very careful and to be ultra conservative in respect to how you read the laws, because that's what the lawyers will do uh, when you go through the due diligence process. They have to do it because they cannot rely on a proper secondary legislation or. Uh, uh, Udication on on these issues. Uh, so this is the main challenge, and um, of course the government could help, but uh, and it has helped in certain areas, but uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, I would like to to add here something. Uh, of course, I agree what Florian said. Uh, in Romania, it's a good uh, country to develop projects. Uh, also spoke with Michael. From, from other countries and it is not so easy. But coming back to the PUS urbanistic zoning plan, um, to be honest, I don't think, and I analyzed a bit in, in detail this, I don't see it usable or necessary for PV. At least for PV, I don't see it. Uh, because of course, when you do a PUS for a, 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 a plot you do it to let's say set up the parameters of, of the land height occupation and so on so this is applicable for when you are building i don't know in an industrial park a residential compound office so on but this is not like this because nine, more than 95 percent of the land is occupied by panels they have the same height and the same design and layout uh, you don't have a footprint of the construction so big so from let's say a plot of 100% of the plot, the real physical footprint of of the panels is less than, I don't know, 10% of the land. And here and there you have some small constructions just to, to put in the inverters and so on. And of course, when you are developing a PV plan, no one will start to build high buildings because you will have shadow to, to, to your PV. So that's why I don't see it, why we should be stuck in having pools which takes longer than six months for this kind of development. I don't. I really don't see it. It should be an easier procedure just to go to building permit, as it should be, and how it is now below 50 hectares for all the surfaces and doesn't matter, and have a quick process. Because in the developing process, we all know we, no one puts money at risk until we have the ATR secured, right? So you go to the ATR, it takes you six months, nine months, I don't know, even more sometimes. And no one wants to start to develop a PUS until there because the PUS cost a lot of money. So you don't know if you have an ATR, if it's feasible to put money at risk. And then you obtain the ATR and then you start to, to do the PUS. Another six, nine months, one year. And so on and so on. And just the development process takes three years. Then you need to have the building permit and the design uh, accomplished in order to place the orders for transformers and so on. Transformers takes another one year and a half. So we'll have projects already uh, functional in five years if we take it like this to be honest guys that's why i think a better connection between the government and um, associations like ours and strongly they should accept what we are recommending because we are facing daily issues needs to be done so a relationship and a better communication between the government and such association needs to 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 have place if you ask me in the future because and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. The, the rest of the participants, but I don't see why we should have a pause in, in in this process. Thank you. Just to to add a piece of information from the association side, uh, we start the work at the Code of Good Practices for the renewables industry in general, together with our colleagues from the Wind Association and also with the support of Solar Power Europe and Wind Europe. And we are hoping that 
until June to have a very good and comprehensive material to be used with the authorities. Also in, uh, in detail related to what we discussed, PUZ, uh, 50 hectares, and any other issues which you are facing in this period of time. This is to only to, to share with uh, all the participants this, uh, this info. Thank you, Andre. Just, oh, yes, yeah, just, just, just read uh, what Bogdan said. Yeah, of course, for uh, for solar, probably you don't need pools as a general rule. You need pools today because there are projects on class uh, one, class two, or which already started the, the procedure. The push procedure are very, very advanced. And now starting from zero, as uh, Florian Michaela mentioned, you need the new urban certificate, a new procedure, and maybe you don't have enough time to get your building permit within 18 months. So it's, it's annoying when the rules are uh, changed during the game. That's, that's the single problem. We don't need uh this for for solar probably for wind is more uh more uh, more important um also coming back to your question Irene, i would say what is very annoying today on developing process and how can we speed up the process you don't know uh who is the owner of the land because the cadastral information are missing uh on uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, counties um, also the same rule are not applicable at every county uh, in in the same manner if some county uh, chief architect in dobroja ask you a piece of uh, document it's not mandatory to to be at the same in moldova or uh, whatever other other region uh, also, the, the part with digitalization, printing out tons of papers, it's really annoying. I mean, we call ourselves green, and it's not, not a real way to do it. So definitely, that maybe they are not very um, critical uh, points to be improved, but if we want to, uh, to have that re-simplify, uh, what everybody's talking about is not only about uh taking out a piece of uh, legislation and that's that's all you start the permitting process with a piece of land and immediately get the building permit you need some uh, some some good measure in place some clarity some transparency uh and a lot of digitalization for sure will help and if i may uh, can you hear me now yeah, yes. um, talking about the code of good practices, in addition to educating investors, I think it's very important to educate authorities because uh, there are a lot of problems faced, uh, and uh, as Radu mentioned, like different approaches from different local authorities. Um, we see a lot of lack of awareness regarding the, the way the, the law should be applied by, uh, by the local authorities starting from, I don't know, uh, incomplete or incorrect urbanism certificates, which are like the main starting point of the entire process. Or for example, um, uh, the local authorities are not aware of the fact that there is a special legal regime to be followed whenever you are installing cables under public roads. And it's, it's uh, the investors are, are in a position that they need to critically assess the permitting process uh, uh, required requested by the authorities and sometimes to convince the authorities they 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 need additional permits or different permits to the ones uh, requested uh, so this is i think this is one of the biggest uh, practical problems the lack of knowledge of the the local authorities in implementing the the legislation yes michael i fully agree with you this is the dual uh purpose of the code uh, also for the investors but also to be used in relation with the authorities indeed thank you on a more sunnier note because it is about sunny forecast for the Romanian market not only the challenges but also the future prospects what is the strength of the Romanian market aside from the legal framework when what we discussed about uh, it being well better suited compared to other states Um, 
I could I could add, you know, Romania is a sunny place. Uh, at least if you are from Austria like me, it's very sunny place. And uh, it's in a very uh, strategic uh, position uh, geographically. Uh, it's the gate between the Balkans area and the Central Europe. Um, it, there's an area with the um, with a, a lot of need for electricity, and the area where it's also to expect that the consumption would grow uh, for the ne next uh, years. And uh, it is a la uh, it's a, la a, la a country with uh, huge surfaces, uh, which uh, allow for the deployment of solar. Um, uh, and uh, the grid infrastructure is is okay of course there needs to be a lot of work to put into it um yeah i think there are many reasons that uh, that are in favor of romania being a future solar electricity exporter uh, to other european uh, countries Just to add here, Florian sometimes is playing the role of the good cop and uh, needs to be someone like him <laughs> here. Uh, but uh, adding what Florian said, also we need to add that uh, we have a huge stock of flat land, and this it's uh, it's very useful to develop PV. Uh, and also to be realistic, if you compare the price of of the lands in southeast of Europe, including Romania, with our countries, it's a huge difference. So it's here. But uh, nevertheless, um, the framework of the leg legislation, I'm going back to the legislation because the, there is the, the, the huge gap, it needs to be uh, um, updated and, and uh, also aligned at the same time, not only updated. Because, uh, and I think Michaela can, can add here, she's more experienced, there are huge gaps uh, between laws. So you have a law where it's stating something, and another law you may end up contradicting the, the, the other law and so on. So all of these need to be correlated because if they won't be correlated, of course, leads to misinterpretation of each council, the each city hall, and so on. Thank you all for the input regarding the strengths of the Romanian market. I will also add that Romania can become a factor of stability in the region in terms of energy exports if we manage to unlock our natural potential. Now, I would like to turn to the questions from the audience. So we have uh, a question uh, as during Mihaela's talk. So my question would be if there is any support scheme government aid for large scale solar investments of an, over one megawatt at the moment, is the Romanian uh, government undertaking any initiative to financially support PV for this year? Did you hear us, Mihaela? Or uh, so you could you me? please repeat the question? So, is there any support scheme or governmental aid for large scale solar investments over one megawatt at the moment? Um, the so, uh, at the moment, no, but uh, as Georgiana just mentioned, the modernization fund is soon to be launched. Everybody, actually, the entire market is waiting for the modernization fund. Uh, it is expected to be launched. The latest estimations are that uh, it will be launched in uh, May. In May. Uh, it was uh, successively postponed. So basically, this would be a good opportunity for, for grants for developing TV plans. Another question is, when we intend to remove a certain area from a permanent metal type of land from agricultural circuit, what percentage from it must be recovered from non-productive land? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, in case of uh, dual system or in case of dual system, the law says that you need to remove from agricultural circuit, uh, the, basically the surface of land that will be no longer be able to use for a different purpose. So for example, in case of pastures, um, <clears throat> although we don't yet have the uh, specific regulations 
But in case of orchard or vineyard, the law, the secondary regulations issued by the Ministry of Agriculture clarify that you only need to remove from agricultural circuit the surface of the land that is affected by the ground um, construction. So basically, it would be only the pillars, the inverters, the transformer station, not only the not all the panel projections of the ground. So basically, this is the huge benefit brought by the dual use of the land. But this is only applicable to dual use of the land. In case um, uh, of classical PVs, you need to remove basically the entire, uh, from the agricultural circuit, the entire area of the, of the land, because basically it is no longer being used for, for agricultural purposes. Thank you. Another question is, many of you mentioned that there is, Tom, what are you doing in the drive? I'm trying to read the question. Um, thank you, Tom. So many of you mentioned that there is a limit of 50 hectares for bigger projects, but there was also mention of, of 50 megawatts. Which one of the indicator is correct? 50 no, hectares. correct is 50, 50 hectares. So the limitation refers to, to 50 hectares. And that would be around 42 megawatts. Yeah, yeah, in case of PVs, yeah. Depends on the design. So for the for the technical experts, they're out. Of course, there's you, you could use uh, 50 hectares for more, but uh, in a typical project, uh, that's why it's often used interchangeable the megawatts and the hectares. But it's hectares. Yeah. I, I think we I think we should clarify here for those who don't develop in Armenia and just participate into this that. The current law doesn't, let's say, stating clear that you are not a law project over 50 hectares. Theoretically, according to the law, you should be able to develop projects over 50 hectares performing a zoning plan, urbanistic zoning plan. But unfortunately, the, some of the government institutions, they interpret this law and they are considering that over 50 hectares, you cannot develop it. So just to be clear, because some other people are looking and I don't want for them to understand that now in Romania you can not develop or there is a strict law stating this. No, it's just a misunderstanding of the law and the way they interpret this because it's not clear. Yes, it's yes indeed, if I may add, this is not uh, something that comes from the law. There is nothing in the law which uh, provides the uh, uh, um, a restriction to developing uh, renewable projects on lands above 50 hectares. It is solely uh, the interpretation of the Ministry of Agriculture. There is nothing in the uh, documents that were elaborating the legislative process uh, following which this new law uh, was adopted that indicate that the legislator had the intention uh, to implement such restriction because basically this is one of the arguments raised in the meetings had with the mini, uh, Ministry of Agriculture, that this was the intention of the legislator. There is no document supporting that this intention uh, indeed uh, exists. So this is why um, uh, RPA uh, prepared a letter to be sent to the parliament, because according to the law, uh, the, the body, the legislative body, which adopts a legal provision, if it uh, concludes that it is misinterpreted in practice, it can issue a new legal enactment for the interpretation of the previous ones. Uh, so basically whereby it clarifies its intention, what it was meant to, to be achieved by the previous legal enactment. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the plan to, to send this letter to the parliament, whereby the parliament would issue, not, not change the legislation, because we all agree that we do not need a legislative change, but would issue a another legal enactment clarifying the, the, the meaning of the previous one. Many of you seem to be interested in CFDs. So how much power will this be this year, a CFD solar megawatt and wind megawatt? I think it was around 750, right in time, in the team presented. If I may, uh, yes, Irene, you're right. Uh, 
754 wind onshore, only onshore, and uh, another 754 uh, PV developments. And they mentioned uh, in their presentation in November that the target is the mature project. We have a question on prosumers for uh, micro installation or res residential projects. So, are there any limitations for, for micro, inst micro installation residential projects? So, are you referring to prosumers here? Could you, could you please send us a chat? <laughs> Here we have the sensor. Uh, um, if, go, go ahead. Maybe, uh, maybe if a bit clarification could be provided regarding this question. So, what kind of limitations uh, uh, are are envisaged? Because we have a special legislation for for consumers, we have also some. Um, Simplified permitting process for for prosumers. For example, you don't need a building permit, even though you are installing the PV panels on on rooftops or on on ground. Um, there is a special, also special uh, financial compensation mechanism applicable quantitative compensation between up to 200 uh, uh, kilowatts and uh, financial compensation between 200 and 400. So yeah, there is a special regime which has been actually improved during uh, during the last two years. Yes, the clarification came later, so it's about the consumers. Uh, another person is curious if they have 150 hectares of land, can they develop a free 50 hectare project? Yes, the answer is yes, you have to split your project. The answer is yes. You can develop also five projects. It's up to the developer. Well, I think that wraps up our, our webinar on uh, the Romanian market and the sunny forecast. Although for some of you, the forecast seems cloudy, uh, I can assure that it is indeed sunny and after we overcome this issue regarding the 50 hectares, I, I'm curious. I'm curious if we should do a webinar on that and see how your perspective changed. Thank you all for the participation. Um, see you in uh, April in Bucharest. Do you have the floor? Thank you. everyone for this panel and as well as for all the attendees of this webinar so as you can see from this really in interesting and engaging discussion that there are lots of challenges but indeed also lots of opportunities like how Irena wrapped it up it's a sunny forecast so we look forward to pursuing all these topics further and indeed meeting the speakers here and more attendees at our summit in Romania on the 27th of April and this is the discount code, so it's 10% as well. And you will be able to use this to get a 10% discount on your ticket in, from this webinar. And after this webinar, we will send you the recording and as well as the slide and also details on how to access this as well. So that will all be available. And yeah, I just wanna say thank you everyone and to RPIA and to all our amazing speakers and have a great day ahead. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.